Okay. Welcome, everyone. We're going to uh, take a few minutes just to let everybody continue uh, logging in and registering because the process is a little bit different than, than typical registration and, and events. So um, we'll be with you very shortly. Actually, while we wait, as there are many people here, um, if you go to the side, I think it's that side for you. Um, it, if you go to the chat feature, could you uh, just put in where you're from, what you do? Um, so, so things that would be interesting to us are, you know, what is your role? What industry are you in? And where are you around the globe? So if you're a student, you can say you're a student in the program you're in, um, which campus you're on, if you're in industry what company you work for, what you do there. And so it'll say there's chat and then you can put it in the underneath chat. You can click event and then I will say I am. There we go. Welcome, David. Hello, Sanami. Nice to have you. Bethany, you don't want us to do it, do you? You can. Please do. Uh, okay. I wasn't sure if we were going to do it just with our voices. One more minute. I see the number is still going up. Happy to see some of my students here. Okay, we'll get started then. Um, welcome everyone. Um, I appreciate that you took the time to come to talk about such an important topic today on examining algorithmic injustice. Uh, before we get started, I'm Bethany Edmonds from the Vancouver campus. I'm Director of Computer Science for uh, Cory College of Computer Sciences. Um, and our Vancouver campus, which is hosting this virtually, uh, if we were on campus today, we would uh, make sure to point out that the land that our campus is on is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. So that's the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish peoples. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have such a beautiful place to uh, live, work, and play. So thank you all for coming. Um, we actually are from all around uh, the, the Northeastern network. And so I'd love for everybody, uh, we're gonna go alphabetically to make this a little bit easier um, on the panel to just introduce yourselves and um, maybe maybe your framing from where you're, where you're coming from to this conversation. So Alexandra. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'm Alexandra Toe. I'm an assistant professor. I'm joint in Cori and in the art and design department uh, in CAMD. Uh, so I'm on the Boston campus. And uh, my background is in human computer interaction, uh, game design, and racial justice and critical race theory. Um, so definitely this, this um, documentary was uh, really at the intersection of, of a lot of the issues that I think about when it comes to, to race and technology. I think I'm next. Is that right, Bethany? Um, so uh, I'm Craig Martell. Um, I'm, I'm an ex-academic, um, but now I had machine learning and I, my expertise is in machine learning and I had machine learning for Lyft. Um, my interest here is, um, you know, we ship a lot of machine learning models. Every company ships a lot of machine learning models and we do it, I'll be honest with you, we do it blindly. 
and we shouldn't. And so my interest is what's the responsibility of the producers of these models? Um, what, what job do we have in ensuring fairness and, and making sure they're not biased? So I'd be next. Uh, so I'm Matt Kopek. I'm the associate director of Northeastern's Ethics Institute. So I just started in August, so I'm relatively new to the campus uh, over in Boston. Uh, my background is in, uh, I have some background in philosophy of race and ethical issues having to do with race and law enforcement. Uh, and then I'm sort of rapidly getting up on, this, on the ethics of AI. And I'm teaching information ethics uh, this current semester. And we've covered some of the topics that are related to the film. So that's, that's, what, uh, that's what interested me in the film. So oh, hello, uh, welcome. I'm Ricardo Baeza Yates. I'm the director of data science programs in the in the Silicon Valley campus and also San Francisco campus of the Bay Area. And my background is in search, uh, data mining, applied uh, and machine learning. And in the last 10, 12 years, I have been working on bias of algorithms, in particular, machine learning algorithms that affect people. And I'm involved in several uh, boards and committees that basically are talking about poli uh, policies to help this problem. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited that you're all here. So uh, for for those that, uh, well, anyway, I, I, I've now, so I have a background in machine learning, my, my PhD is in machine learning, and uh, I'm, I'm very much now getting into the AI ethics space. So I'm, I'm very excited to have this conversation as I find that the conversation evolves based on who you're talking to and what your lens is. So I'm, I'm really excited to have so, so many different voices uh, in this conversation. So um, the first point I think um, that, that we should maybe start with is, while the group movie did a great job exposing some of the secrets of, of the AI shortcomings and maybe the, the uses of it, um, what are some things that people don't know about AI? Um, Matt, do you want to start? Uh, so, yeah, so, well, I think it depends on, on who you're talking about. So whether you're talking about um, the, the people who are, who are involved in using AI products and things like that. So I think, the main, I think the main thing that people don't really know is they don't know the extent of the use of AI in society. So um, I, I'm just, I'm mainly saying that because I didn't know about it until I started reading about all of the various ways in which AI sort of affects our lives. Um, I think that people don't really know, I think the public doesn't know about the extent of the data that the AI systems are working on. And I think in general, they don't really know the extent of the inferences that can be made from that the, that the machine learning algorithms can, can make about people given the data that they're working from. There've been some high profile uh, stories. So like the, the target story where they basically outed a woman who was pregnant uh, by, they basically predicted the woman, that the woman was pregnant from, you know, her, her behavior online. Uh, so there've been some high profile cases, but I think people don't generally know the extent of, of, of uh, AI's ability to make inferences about people. And I think they'd be pretty um, angry if they, if they knew how much could be inferred um, about us from the data that's being collected. Um, so that's as far as the public is concerned. Ricardo, from your, from your side? Yeah, so to, to continue on, on, on uh, Matt's uh, answer, I would say that the next thing people don't know is that they can be nudged and, and change your behavior. And, and that's uh, shown in the movie with the Facebook uh, experiment 2010, where more people voted just because they were shown different things uh, in their screens. So it's a lot of digital nudging and these small uh, events basically may change your behavior or not, because also you have a social bias based on what other people do. In the case of the Facebook experiment was your friends. So you are basically biased also to what other people do. And then depending on, on your perception of reality, that may change. And, and of course, this is one of the main things that behind fake news. But I think that the other thing that, that people don't know is uh, we already talk about people that use this tool. But I, there are more subtle things like digital markets, like uh, e-commerce markets, where different sellers, different producers, or different uh, publishers, depending on what you are selling, as music, uh, books, uh, items, anything, they are also affected by these uh, algorithms. And they may be selling less or more, depending on how these algorithms uh, basically favor or discriminate them. 
you bring up a really good point with with social bias, right? Um, and we, we a lot of times it, it comes up a little bit here and there. But so um, I'd, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on what are the various ways that that social bias can actually go into uh, artificial intelligence and technology. And I'll start with Alexandra. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I could I could speak to that a little bit. I mean, I think um, you know. Incredible scholars like Sophia Noble and Ruha Benjamin have written about and talked about this quite a lot, especially um, this year. But uh, the data that we're collecting is biased because the society that we live in is biased, right? So if what we're doing is just trying to take everything that our society does, the decisions that we make, um, and try to replicate that um, with machine learning, we're going to have those same outcomes happening over and over again, right? So. I think specifically, um, Ruha Benjamin refers to it as the new gym code, right? Is, is taking these oppressive and biased decision-making metrics that we have and putting them in an algorithm that we then label as being objective or as, as being, you know, like outside of, of the biases of humans because it's making these, these decisions on its own, but it's making them based on historic data. I love that. I, uh... One of the, the quotes that I always use is um, from the Pinboard CEO and founder, which is that machine learning is the money laundering of bias, right? So people assume that machines are going to be truthful uh, and, and be, um, you know, objective. And, and really they, they're just taking what we've done for forever and, and put it into numbers, right? Craig, you had, you had a comment? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> so you know what's ironic is after you told me I was muted, I said, oh, that would make it really difficult, as if you could hear me say that. Um, so <laughs> what I was saying is I, I really want to expand on Alexander's point um, and, and make it slightly more technical. I totally agree with what she said. Um, but AI models are built by gathering labeled data where the data says this is A and this is B, this is A and this is B. And you do that millions upon millions upon millions of times times and then the model finds a correlation between some things in the world and calling it a and other things in the world and calling it b right so that that we we uh, we build an ai model by finding it's it's just it's what it is is statistics at scale we we massively count things in the world and we say these things that we've counted are correlated with this and these things that we've counted are correlated with this um so we're not we're not I'm assuming most of us are not setting out to take a bias <clears throat> and encode it in the machine. What our goal is, is to solve some problem. We want to show ads. We want to ship you a car. We want to get a car when you want. We want to match riders and drivers. We want to help you find a job, right? All of those are the reasons we start these things, but we have to go get data. So we go get data from the past. That's the only place we can get data is things that have happened before. And to Alexander's point, the things that have happened before have the built-in social biases. So when we go sample the world, we're not going to sample to buy it, to find a bias, to create a bias. We're just going to sample the world. But the world is biased. And I think it's incumbent upon AI researchers to get that piece. Most of the engineers think, well, I'm just going to go object. This is, again, I think I'm just speaking to Alexander's piece, uh, Alexander's point. Um, uh, most of the engineers just think, oh, I'm going to go get objective truth in the world. And I'm going to build a model that has objective truth. But and it is objective truth in the sense that I'm just I'm not bringing my own my own personal bias. I'm just going to randomly sample in a perfect world. I'm just randomly sampling. But even that randomly sampling is randomly sampling a set of biased behaviors from which we gathered the from which we gathered the data. Um, so my, my only real point there is it, we're, we're not our goal isn't to create the bias. And most most engineers don't even think about it, which is a big, huge part of the problem. It's just that what we're grabbing is in fact biased. Yeah, and I think that that speaks to some of what I was thinking about, Bethany, with your first question, right? Which is like, part of that question was, what do consumers not know about machine learning and AI? But the other half of that question, right, was what do developers not know? And I think to me, it's like that, that AI is not gonna save you. Um, this is a, I, I was speaking with my students about this earlier this evening, actually, and I, I saw a couple of them are here, but right, I mean, AI is really powerful for dealing with large quantities of data. And again, these, these decisions and finding out these relationships that we don't know about, 
But if your thought is that it's going to save you time or make things more efficient so you can free up your time for other kinds of pursuits, I don't think that's that's really true, right? You're just automating some process um, that is potentially amplifying some harm. And then your time is just spent on, on other forms of increasing your productivity. It's not like because you've automated this, now you get to go have free time and enjoy creative pursuits. It's not actually fulfilling that role that you might think that it is. Now you're muted, Bethany. <laughs> could I could I add one thing to the um, to the where where can the bias sneak in, or I'll just go yeah. ahead and yeah. Go ahead, so, go ahead and I will continue. Uh, so one of the, one of the things that I um, thought was really nice about the film is that uh, they they sort of they hinted at this and didn't didn't make it as explicit, but oftentimes the biases can actually come from the the uh, from the corporate world from the top down by by choosing your clientele. So just just as an example, uh, so, I, so I remember in the film, there was this one, uh, uh, one of the cases where um, a woman was trying to get the soda machine to recognize her face so that she could get a soft drink. Uh, and you can imagine how there there would be there'd be technological limitations on, for example, how, how tall someone could be. Um, so for example, if someone was disabled and was in a wheelchair and was attempting to use that that product, they wouldn't be able to use it. Um, and so there's so one of the things that I, that I think came out in a couple of places is that oftentimes these corporations will choose who their clientele would be. Sometimes it, it'll actually be the AI that's sort of choosing who to target. Um, and because of that, you can these kinds of biases can can filter in as well. So, for example, uh, if you're if you're looking to target with your facial recognition device, people from a certain country or people of a certain sort, then those are also ways in which uh, in which biases can sneak in. Uh, having nothing to do with the data itself. It's really sort of driven top down. I thought that that came out in the film relatively well. Now, to, to continue with that topic, I think it, it's important that, that sometimes also is missing data. So for example, you don't have uh, all the types of faces in your data, like what Craig was saying, A and B, but the, you don't have an A and B from this part of the problem. So you replicate, uh, for, for example, uh, certain kind of demography and not others. And, and, and this is interesting uh, because uh, you have some biases also when you choose these demographics because if these are closer to, to what your world and people you see, but you don't consider the whole extent of the problem. Now, now when I, I mentioned social bias for the first uh, uh, question that you make, Bethany, I was thinking on, on the cognitive social bias in the sense that we can be influenced by other people. So in our own decisions. I was thinking like uh, if you go to e-commerce and you see that there are 500 reviews that have five stars, I choose that because 500 people said that. But maybe those 500 people are, are half fake. And, and that's why Amazon keeps suing people for doing fake reviews because they're getting paid for that. And, and I did some research where I showed that the best reviews most probably are fake because they're better written because they were paid for them. So, so there's a correlation between quality and, and fakeness, which is the opposite of what you will expect. Now, uh, another thing that I think is important is that that, that uh, algorithms can uh, magnify the, the social biases that you have in the data. Now, I'm talking about the cultural biases like uh, sexism and racism. So this could be magnified. And the best example is this um, a study that the Department of Economy of the US uh, uh, asks uh, very well-known researchers from Cornell, Stanford, and other places on, on bails in New York. And the only data they gave to the system about every person was the age of that person. Not even the gender, because most of them are male, but that's a known bias that they call people that go to, to a judge uh, is, is a male. But only was the gender, sorry, only was the age. But the algorithm at the end was more racist than the judges. So racism, racism was encoded in the data in other ways that are very hard to understand, but the, the system captures. But the, but, the, but the amazing thing that even I would prefer that um, algorithm is because there are some difference between algorithmic decisions and human decisions. So algorithmic decisions are fair in the sense that even if the algorithm is racist, for two people with the same, let's say, problem or case, you will get the same answer. So the answer is deterministic. Human decisions are very noisy. 
and sometimes noise can be even worse. And for example, uh, there, there's some known work that if you see a judge after lunch, that's the worst time you can see a judge because they, if they didn't have lunch, uh, the, the result would be bad for you. Maybe the best time is just after breakfast in the morning, depending if the person slept well or not. There are many external factors that change the, 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 the behavior of people. So they are, they are not consistent with their decisions. And Daniel Kahneman and other people have really studied uh, how, how, how noise changes. So sometimes we have to choose, choose maybe between a biased algorithm or a noisy human. And that choice is not very easy. So depending on the case, I may choose the algorithm. Uh, Ricardo, I actually agree with, with everything you said, but I'd like to, um, maybe we can agree on some nomenclature. I don't actually think it's fair to call it a racist algorithm. I mean, there may be racist algorithms where racism is actually encoded in the algorithm, but for the, all the things we've been talking about and things in the movie, it was biased or even racist data. Um, uh, I don't think the algorithm itself is inherently racist. For example, if you trained it with unbiased data, it would not perpetuate uh, the, the, biased, um, the, the biased past. Uh, and I'm curious what you guys think about that, but I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable. Yeah. It's slightly inflammatory. So yes, no, I understand your point, but but in, in, in if if the if the bias is magnified, the algorithm is also partly responsible of that. If it's the same, I agree with you. So there's not a problem. Well, algorithm. But but one problem today is that there are many biases that are produced by algorithms, especially in the user interaction with people, that people really are not aware of. Uh, for example, nudging would be one case, and this is a problem. Uh, also problem. perpetuate perpetuating. Uh, uh, racist, racist judgments about how long you should be in jail, for example. Yeah, and I'm saying that if you have a, a, an increment on the bias, the problem is in the algorithm, not in the data. So, so my problem with that is, is it's solvable by changing the training data and you don't actually have to train, change the algorithm. So if you change the, tra so it, we're not actually tackling, we're not pinpointing the problem if we call it a racist algorithm. It's racist data. And yes, the algorithm does perpetuate it, but we can solve that by, by sampling correctly. We can actually do a set of behaviors to try to overcome that bias and it won't perpetuate it without changing the algorithm itself. So I, I'm, I'm worried that we're, we're yeah. saying the, that, that we're going to think the solution's over here when the solution's over here. No, well, but I disagree with the people that say that only the bias is in the data, that uh, even, even famous people is saying that. And I, I deeply disagree because I have many examples where the, 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 the bias comes from the algorithm and I can give it to you. So, so. No, I'm in agreement with you that the bias can magnify I mean, so, so, and I'm, I'm more than happy to be wrong. So correct mm -hmm. me, no problem. Um, um, I'm in, almost past me. Um, I'm in agreement that, that, the, um, that the algorithm will perpetuate and magnify the biases from the training data. But I, what the statement I'm making is if we had unbiased training data, it would be, it would be okay. The and algorithm would then yeah. create a bias. So yeah, I, this, that's why I was worried about calling it a racist yeah, in this example, in, the, in this example, maybe you're right, but I would need a proof saying that, that basically this, this uh, magnification in, exists only because there is some bias in the data, but you haven't proved that too. Fair enough, Imagine, fair, enough. And, and, fair enough. But there are other cases where all the bias comes from the algorithm, and these are the most important in e-commerce, like popularity bias or expo uh, expo exposure bias which are the, the ones that really people are not aware of, and they're dealing, all people, not only depending on race, gender, all people is basically suffering this kind of biases. And it's good to disagree, we're in a panel. We have to disagree. No, I, I have no problem disagreeing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bethany, I think you muted again. Oh. So I, I was just going to add one. I was going to add one more thing too. So I, I agree with Ricardo. One of the problems is that you don't have access to unbiased data when you have a history of the results of oppressive behaviors, and so it's it's hard not to call that, especially in a case where it where it where it magnifies racist tendencies. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's almost it, it almost doesn't really help to sort of say, well, if we had unbiased data, then the algorithm wouldn't would make these kinds of judgments. Oh, no, it does. Because oh, you just don't have. Because, 
you don't have access to unbiased data. You can't go through you can't go through the the historical data and erase all of the traces of no, but you can sample behaviors. differently. You, you don't can, have the access can, to that. You can be aware of the biases that create that. So if look at in the movie, it started off with uh, real not facial expression not working well for the the darker the skin, the less well it works and works well for males and doesn't work well for females. And IBM retrained, yeah. resampled, sampled differently, and had a very different distribution. Being aware of the bias in the data allows you to actually correct for it. You can actually go sample differently. You, we, we ship, we ship when, when we ship search, uh, image search at Dropbox, we engage with ERGs to search for problematic situations. And when we found problematic situations, we went and sampled differently so that we could train, train those problems away, not away. So how would you do that in the case of like a, a recidivism prediction algorithm? How would you go through and sample differently to erase the effects of that racism has taken on people's employment prospects, wealth, yeah, my, my effects thing. of the police on people. So, so I think, I think this is where, where we need to, to, to basically, I think you're both are right, but not always you can apply uh, sampling, correct? Because of the, some problems are very hard to sample in, a, in an unbiased way, but it's even more. In some problems, we don't know what is the right uh, value. So we don't have the right reference value. For example, if someone asks me uh, what should be the right percentage of women uh, attending this panel, I would say 50%, but it's just because it's, my, it's what I believe, but, but maybe I'm wrong. So depending on, on if, uh, for example, we are trying to influence policymakers because of the bias we have in society, we should have more men watching this. It's very hard to know what is the right reference value to sample right when you have uh, biased data. Uh, I agree, and and Matthew, I agree with you as well. I, I think this is a separation of concerns, though. I mm. think I think one these these are policy questions, which I am say I'm not. I have I have a strong opinion, but I'm not qualified to answer. Um, and so I I think that's a policy question. And Matthew, if we can't sample correctly, I don't think we should use the AI. Like if we if if we're not if, I'm, okay I, I'm with that not in arguing, the case of recidivism prediction. I, I, I'm not taking the I'm not taking the engineer engineer should win perspective here here, here at all. In fact, I'm saying engineers be hyperethical, and if we can't actually come to a decision about what the right policy is and sample it so it doesn't produce bias impact, that's the important part. Sample so that it doesn't produce bias impact, then we shouldn't ship it. Can I can I quote you? Can I Absolutely. I, I don't know what do, what good it'll do you, but sure. So I have a question just following up on that, like what, as we have many developers and people that are going to school in computer science on, on the call, like, is it the, the programmer's um, job to, uh, to, to decide what, when something should be deployed or not? Or is it the organizations? Like, it, who's, whose responsibility is that? Uh, all of ours. So my my attitude on this one is that um, I think programmers have an obligation not to work for companies that they would predict are going to do things that are unsavory, unjust, immoral, etc. Uh, just like I think I think that's true just in general. So for example, like uh, the example I was thinking of when when you had sent this question was um, if you were a, a genetic engineer who was working on like a rapid gene test for Monsanto or something like that. So, and, and you kind of could predict that the way in which that company was gonna use that technology was to go around to all the little farmers whose crops are getting sort of cross-pollinated with the genes of Monsanto seed, finding out who's doing it and then leveraging legal cases against them to basically, uh, to basically shut them down or force them to start using Monsanto seed. Like if, if you kind of could predict that a company was gonna do that sort of thing, uh, I think it's I think it's on you to not work for a company and not to develop those, those sorts of technologies. Uh, and I think it, with a lot of the big um, the big tech companies now, I think it's becoming more obvious that a lot of them are going to do kind of unsavory things along the way. So I think that it actually it's becoming it's increasingly becoming the responsibility of uh, of coders and programmers to sort of do research on what what the companies that they're thinking about working for are actually engaged in, because um, I think that is that is on them. So, so let me add to that 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 was the in, in the movie you can see that I think was the ethics of people that changed the ethics of companies 
because after a lot of people and also the public, uh, the press and all that complain about, for example, facial recognition, then you had uh, companies like IBM, Microsoft, and they forgot to, to uh, mention all the companies that basically had a, a, a ban, a temporal ban on selling software, uh, facial recognition software. And uh, also this year, uh, ACM, uh, where I belong to the US uh, Policy Technology Committee, also uh, recommended to basically temporarily ban uh, facial recognition software because of the same reason, because the data, the training data was not the best one. And also, even if IBM fixed the problem, uh, they fixed just that problem. We haven't fixed all the problems, and we don't know what are the, all the problems. So there's a really great conversation going on in the uh, in the chat that I do want to point out. So um, in response to Matt's uh, comment, it th there's a question of whether you know is that coming from a place of privilege where you get to choose where you work, um, and and what does that and, and so I kind of want to pivot a little bit to say you know that programmers often come from a certain demographic and don't necessarily see the impact of what they're doing or that they they're coming from this particular place. And I do also want to recognize that, like on this panel, we we can't get everybody from we weren't able to get everybody from every demographic. So how do we actually, um, whether it's as programmers, as product managers, or or that, how do we actually make sure that we open that conversation so that everybody is able to inform, either letting us know where these. Um, problems are coming about because maybe it's not impacting me. Maybe it's not impacting my family. And as a programmer, I don't actually know the implications of my software or um, or just an awareness. Uh, so how do we actually open up the dialogue to to get view, to, to listen to different viewpoints and to get a better understanding of our of the implication of our work? Alexander, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. I mean, Right, there's there's a, a very real conversation about about basic needs and and you know people's ability to take care of themselves. But I think that um, I I don't view it as this binary decision between like you know your job security or your morals and your ethics. Right, I think there are ways to to live through your morals and ethics no matter what position you're in. Although you know I there are, there are some companies that I would never suggest that someone work for. Um, but in terms of, of our responsibility to, to look at the impact of the things that we're creating, right? I mean, I think the, the very bare minimum is that it's your responsibility to care about the impact. And I think that for some of us, that sounds really obvious, um, but it's not obvious to everyone, right? Especially those of us who are in academia, who have chosen a career path in academia, right? Our job very much is, is to research and to innovate and to create new technologies that are capable of doing uh, really interesting, incredible, novel things. And I, I do have colleagues who, when pushed about like, well, have you thought about the impact that this might have on people? Sometimes the answer will come back that it's like, well, if I didn't make it, somebody else would. And I never think that that's an appropriate answer. It is your responsibility to think about and work through the ethics of what you create or what you study or what you build. Um, and certainly, you know, if, if you make something with all the best intentions and you try to think through all those problems and someone does take the thing that you make and manipulate it to do something uh, that harms other people. I mean, it's not that that responsibility is completely on you, that it is you know, your fault that what you built is manipulated, um, but, but you do bear some responsibility to, to speak out about those things then and say like, this is not what I built this for, or I don't think this is appropriate, or to just be vocal um, when, when those uh, manipulations happen. Um. So, I mean, Ricardo, I, I know you were in industry in the past, and Bethany, I don't know that, but as the, I think as the, the only person on the panel who's currently in industry, um, I, I actually think about this slightly differently. And or maybe I don't, but I think I think about it slightly differently, which is um, I, I want to work for a company who's taking the right corporate responsibility. So I'm making it very personal. I'm not going to make a grand ethical statement. I don't know what's right for other folks. Um, what's right for me, though, is to work for a company that wants to do it right. And so I take it as my ethical responsibility to tell people what I think the right thing we should do is. And if the company I'm working for doesn't want to hear that or doesn't engage with me in a conversation about that, then I'm not going to be interested in working for them. Um, I, I want to point out a company that I think is absolutely nailing it with from the perspective of um, trying to do ethical AI. And it's a really fascinating one. And 
And we can all probably all get a virtual beer and talk about this company afterwards, but it's the company Axon. Axon makes the taser. And uh, so already there's a whole bunch of ethical, fascinating questions there just about that product. But they also built, make a body camera. And that body camera captures all the information, supposed to capture all the information and make inferences about the event of police interacting with, with um, uh, the public. They have an external panel that they bring every AI model to, and they will not ship that model unless that external panel says yes. And in addition, there are some models they won't ship even if that panel says yes. And I, if I remember correctly from talking to them, um, on that panel are police officers, members of the public, um, elected officials, um, both, so both sides of the public and the police are represent and, and the governing bodies are represented on that panel. And I'm, maybe I'm idealizing it, but let's just take it as ideal for a moment. Um, and then those folks have to say they need to uh, they need to say yes, you can ship that. And they have a huge debate. Oh, and the, what I really love is the builder of that model has to go to that panel and tell them why they're building it and what's the benefit for building it and what are the potential costs. That kind of conversation. I don't know the right solution. I don't know what model should ship or not ship. That's a very those are very deep ethical questions. But I want to work for a company. That, that is willing to have that kind of conversation, ideally. Um, so that would be my personal stance. So can I add to that? Uh, yeah, I'm still kind of in, in half in academia and half in industry. Oh, sorry, so, I, I uh, didn't. No, no, but I, I agree completely with you. I, I, I also, maybe with age, every, every time I'm more concerned to be in a company that is ethical. Like for example, another good example for me will be Apple with privacy. So using differential privacy and not logging everything from the user, which is also important for me because uh, there are too many companies that know already too much for me, from my data. But, uh, so, so also we need to distinguish between the ethical responsibility that we all have and also the corporate uh, corporation has with the legal responsibility, which is a different one, depending on, 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 on the current laws in different countries is different. Uh, and then uh, when... Bethany asked who, who should be uh, in charge or who, who should be like looking at this. For me, I think we need a new ways to, the, to develop these technologies because you gave a good example about the board, but basically that, that you can only chip a model at the end when if the board approves, like an like a ethical board for an experiment or for research in the university. And, and by the way, but, someone in the audience is on that board, so we yes, can ask them if yes, I got yes. it right. So that, that was great. Uh, Tracy, Tracy Cosa. There. But but I think we need more than that. For example, um, maybe too late when you get to that board with the model because you did a mistake and you lost a lot of money that, that's not good for the company. I think you need to, to have contest points where you challenge your assumptions that may trigger these problems very early, like after the design, after the first prototype, after the first A-B test, and then finally the one that you mentioned after the model. So you contest with maybe different people every time, all your assumptions and someone will, like if you have a political activist will say, have you considered A, B, C, D, A, F, G? And the issue is that not is that you didn't want to consider, is that you didn't know all it because you, you didn't have so many points of view. So you need to have more points of view. Uh, Ricardo, I completely agree. Uh, the reason why when we did image search at Dropbox is we asked the ERGs, the employee research groups, so, the Latin Employee Research Group, the Women Employee Research Group, the Black, we asked them to do the searches that they think might give danger to the community yeah, right. because we as the nerdy engineers weren't thinking about those things at all <laughs> and we wanted to get outside of our own heads. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, that does, so I, I guess I'm gonna go and say, we're talking very specifically um, about AI, and I'm just wondering for the, for the people that aren't necessarily in AI but are in software, why is AI different than other kinds of software when we're talking about ethics? Go ahead, Matt. Well, just because it's more of a black box than most other technologies, and so you don't exactly know what's going to be spit out once you unleash it on the world. That's the main difference, I think. Also, another difference is something you already mentioned, is that you can get amplified bias, which usually you don't get in other techniques. Uh, and this is also very important for me, because there are many examples that this already happened. Like if, 
you had some uh, gender bias and now it's worse. And, and we should go the other way around. Right? You have some small affirmative action to go the other way around. So then, then let's start being optimistic. What can we actually do? Let's say we, we choose a company that we're happy. We think that they're trying to do the right thing. So then what can we do to make these systems more fair and make our processes more fair? Or we're in a company and we, we're trying to get them to, to acknowledge what we did. Um, and so I know the Ethics Institute uh, that, that Matt's a part with and um, the Vancouver campus and the Seattle campus, you know, we, we started the Cascadia initiative uh, last year with the commitment for the conscientious adoption and deployment of AI, which actually walks a company through, okay, how do we consult uh, communities and, and, and how do we, but how do we start a process with, if you're not sure your organization's thinking about this or your organization's thinking about going into AI or the software that, that, that they're doing, what are some things that we can do to make our software more fair? Were you asking at sort of the corporate policy level or how we actually do the coding? What we think about when we're doing the coding? I think it, it can be answered at many levels, but how can a single person who wants to do this be empowered? And so that's either through, um, this may be a software developer, but it may just be somebody in an organization that, um, that sees that their their organ that their software is maybe harming people. So I, I would I would start with the one level, the most basic level. Everyone should be aware of this, not not only the coder or, or the company, everyone. And I think I would take the the Finland approach. Here is a course, every everyone should take it, and the prime minister take it first. That's. That's, I think, the perfect approach. I, give, I do the example, and then all the people know what you, the, the uh, marvelous things you can do with technology, but also you know the issues that you have with technology. Imagine that we have, the, we have done this um, for, for uh, uh, atomic power or for other things that, that have good uses and bad uses, um, uh, like X-rays. And there are many movies about that, but the movies are come, came, came later, not earlier. I, I would prefer to have this before. So we think we think in ethics, sadly in history, after the facts, not before the facts. Uh, I'd like to echo what Ricardo said. I think uh, education is extremely important. I think for most people um, in a company, and from even for most software developers, uh, how AI perpetuates bias is completely opaque. Um, how AI actually works is opaque, and therefore how, <laughs> how it perpetuates bias is opaque. Um, I think as an individual, you can just speak up and start educating. You can start telling everybody, and you can start asking the right questions. Um, let's say we're going to ship a model that uh, looks at someone's face for some reason. Ask, um, have you sampled correctly across all uh, skin tones? Have you sampled across genders? Um, what is the, what is, so here's an extremely important one that I think most people don't think about. What is the human escape hatch if someone gets it wrong? And by human escape hatch, I mean, if I mislabel you and it has a negative impact, say in my world, where I don't give you a ride or I don't, as a driver, I don't give you a rider and that negatively impacts your ability to get to your job or it negatively impacts your ability to make money as a driver, what's the human escape hatch? Have we thought through how do we how do we fix how, we, we want to fix it in the beginning, but when the bad thing sneaks through, how do we fix it then as well? Just asking these kinds of questions, and you can ask my peers. I'm I'm a needler about this. I just think you should be poking people all the time to be asking the right questions. Yeah, and I, I like Ricardo and Craig what you're we're both speaking to these sort of different levels of education, right? So there's this sort of broader public education that needs to happen around what AI and ML are capable of and what they're not. And there's also sort of this lower level, almost like a usability issue, right? Which is, is how I think about some of these things as someone in HCI, right? Which is, um, there was a, a, a group of HCI researchers who published um, guidelines for human AI interaction um, uh, a couple of years ago, right? And a lot of it has to do with like, you know, teaching people when they're using these interfaces, like 
demonstrating what is this good at? What is it not good at? Um, what is the likelihood of seeing a mistake um, when you're using this interface? Um, and you know, what kinds of precautions should you take as you're using this as a tool, not as something to replace your decision making, but to augment it or to use it responsibly? Yeah, let, let, uh, I would like to add something to what uh, Craig said that that in Europe uh, you already have that 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 mechanism when you basically are uh, are affected by automated decision. This is in Article 22 of the, the the privacy directives of the European Union GDPR, and basically you have the right to contest the decision. and And I'm sure you are aware, but uh, recently, you know, I think it was like less than two weeks ago. Uh, for Uber drivers, uh, three in the UK and one in, in, in Portugal, uh, sue Uber in the Netherlands because they are based there in Europe because an algorithm decided that they were cheating and they lost their jobs. And this was using this article of, of, of this uh, uh, law. And this is being used already this year in many cases. So basically, sadly, uh, instead of having like a human in the loop where you have a, a person you can talk to and solve the problem before it goes to the court, uh, this is being used to go to court to basically say the algorithm mislabeled me. So Ricardo, I, I think that's awesome. And GDPR is a huge step forward for the world. But I, I'm, I'm I like that. GDPR is all, all good. Just yeah, I know that. I know, I know. <laughs> Let's not go down the rabbit hole. But I actually agree with Alexander. When I say the human escape hatch, I meant much more short short term like oh okay. suing someone takes forever um yes. i mean if i if i were to deny a ride what can i do right now what what's I, I alexander i love your point what what can the ui tell me about why the decision was made how can i contest it right then is there anything i can do to help inform the system that they got it wrong that it got it wrong and and have a human immediately jump in between um most companies don't like that because it's expensive but i i really i, I was thinking much more in these sort of short loops, Alexander, I really liked it. One of your students posted the uh, guidelines, by the way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is very important to have to have a, a way to complain right away and, and be heard. Oh, that's another faculty, by the way, not one of my students. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. They, they refer to you as doctor, so I made the assumption as a student. <laughs> you have a bias there, Craig. I do. <laughs> I, I have tons of biases. <laughs> I'm kidding. Matt? Yeah, can I just add something about the education? So I think I think um, doing formal courses and things like that, probably, I don't know how, how, how feasible that would be, but one way that we actually could educate the public is by essentially changing the regulations on how tech companies are required to educate us about how they're going to be engaging with us. And so one of the, one of the projects that I'm, that I'm uh, just starting on now is a, attempting to sort of argue that we have a right to access to the information of how we're how our privacy, for example, is going to be um, violated. So currently, the way that use and consent works on the internet, it's sort of they just sort of say, you know, if you use this product, then you just consent to whatever we want to do with anything that we collect. That's sort of the model. Um, and if you were to try to sort of go through and actually figure out how exactly are am I being uh, treated by this company, it would be impossible because there'd be thousands and thousands of pages of you know because. The data is being collected from one source and then it's being sold to another source and it's being sold to another source. So if you were to actually track down all those documents, um, you know, very few people would have the time or the or the knowledge to sort of figure out exactly how you're being you know, engaged with by this by this corporation. And I think that uh, in cases where we're sort of giving up our privacy and being manipulated in such extensive ways, I think that that we clearly have a right to access um, to, to, to actual um, understandable, you know, clear cut explanations as to how they're going to be using the things that they're collecting. Um, and I think if, if we had regulations like that, um, then I think more people would end up understanding exactly how these products work and exactly how they're being influenced. I don't think there's anything like that in the GDPR, is it? It's mostly about, so I, I, I'm not up on the GDPR, but does the GDPR essentially insist that you explain to consumers how they're being treated, how their data is being collected, and what sorts of tools are being used on them. There, there is a part on explainability in the Article 22. So basically, you need to explain the decision because if you can explain it, you may decide if you have to complain or not. Because uh, otherwise, it's like uh, complaining because I don't know the, how the decision was taken. But I think it doesn't cover all the aspects you are mentioning because it only covers the aspects of the, the current decision and not, for example, 
and how the data was gathered. There are many things that are more important, like in the in the seven properties that Alvin had, should fulfill that ACM did three years ago. And basically, the first point is awareness that we're discussing now. But all algorithms don't have these seven properties, so they don't explain. They 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 don't accountable and so on. Yeah, I think something like Facebook should be should be required to explain to you that they might affect your voting behavior, for example. So, um, so, so Pat, I don't know how I how I feel about that. All of the rest of us are saying it's education. Did NU not send you the the thing that we're educators and we're supposed to say it's education? She's kidding, Matt. Well, we need to raise uh, policymakers who can actually make this happen because there's, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. So this is, I mean, this wasn't one of the questions, but um, so you, you, I guess this question was sort of uh, about broadening the way in which people could be involved in, in how these products are being created. Um, one thing that I was thinking about is, I mean, um, the amount of lobbying that these big tech firms engage in is massive. Um, and figuring out a way to get, you know, political movement on any of these things would be extremely difficult. So um, I don't know how feasible it is to get these kinds of things passed through ballot measures or things like that, but I, but you definitely need to raise the next generation of uh, public policy folks to sort of figure out how we can actually get this working. So that's education. So, but before being uh, positive, I'm gonna go a little bit more negative on this and say, even if people had the education, right? It, some of these software companies that we talked about before, people are starting to know, and it's not necessarily changing their behavior. Do we really trust that people are going to do what's best for them, right? Even if we were able to, to tell everybody, this is how we're using your data, do we really think that that would drive to companies not flourishing or not being as big as they are? Or like, do, do we really think that, that, that the cons should the consumer and will the consumer actually make a difference in this, even if they're fully educated? You are, you are asking, do we need the regulation? There, essentially, essentially, uh, I, I believe so. And for example, yes. this, year, this year we had the regulation in the U.S. on facial recognition, and GDPR also regulates many aspects of this in the European Union. And every country is doing the, these things. Yes, of course, we need to. I yeah, think they would know. vote for regulations before they would uh, vote with their dollars with regulations. So there's a lot of research on people's unwillingness to give up social media. So I just deactivated my Facebook account and I feel much better off for it. Um, but I'm very tempted to go back on. Like I sometimes type it into the actual search bar. Oh, I, ju uh, I just friended you on Facebook, Matt. Come on, join. <laughs> uh, I was forced to get onto LinkedIn because of this event, uh, because I think Ricardo's page was on LinkedIn. So now I've been sucked back in. Um, but yeah, but there, there's, this, there's this strong tendency. So people, you have to pay people a ton of money to give up social media. So um, they're not willing to pay for it much. Uh, it's one of these weird paradoxes. So Cass Sunstein talks about this in his in his new book, Got Too Much Information, uh, if anybody's read it. But yeah, he talks about how, um, you know, if you were to, if, if someone says, how much would you pay to, to, uh, to be on Facebook per month, people will pay like $2. And then they'll ask, how much would you have to be paid to be off of Facebook? They'll say $100. Um, and so it's, it's one of these weird things. It's kind of like an addiction, right? Yeah, I have a paper on the opposite. How, how much social networks should pay you to be there? So because then so, people will be there. So this this view that that we want to change people's behaviors, it, it, I, I share it. But I, I have a, a nine year old and a three year old, and I, I look at my nine year old, and I can't judge the world that she's going to be in by the world that I grew up in. I can't judge the world that she's going to exist in by the fact it's very comfortable for me to put down a screen, and even for me, it's not completely comfortable. And I grew up way before screens. Right, but it's easier for me. For the, the her screen mediates the world for her, and that will always be the case. That's the world she's going to live in, and I think it's a mistake. And I don't have an answer today, but I think it's a mistake if we say we've got to stop that or stop versions of that. Social media is going to mediate the world for her, and and the screens will mediate the world for her. They are just facts of life, facts of her new life, and so. Um, we actually need to, uh, my view is I need to educate her to be able to make the right choices in that world. And I think we need to educate lawmakers so that they can correctly um, regulate them. You can't regulate them with the notion of the Fourth Amendment when it talks about papers and keeping your papers safe. That world is gone. And the, the policymakers don't understand the new world. 
And we need to um, up level the education for both the users and the policymakers. And other than that, I have no answers other than, but we can't tell her to stop. I think, tell, I think telling kids to not do that is just not gonna work. I told you I could, bad, I could just be a bad parent. <laughs> Um, so, so I, I, I'm a firm believer in tech and I, I really actually believe in machine learning and, and the powers that it has. So I actually want to um, get us thinking, are there ways that AI can help us solve some of the injustices or biases that are currently in the world? Is there any way that, that it could be a solution or technology could be a solution to some of these human ills that we currently have? I or is it all bad? <laughs> I, I can start. So, so uh, there are many ways. I'm sure that Alex, Alexander can talk a little bit more about that. But for example, one thing is that I will give more control to the user in, in, in interfaces. So basically, uh, many times I would like to make a decision and not let the algorithm make the decision for me. For example, how much personalization. Uh, maybe I want to watch uh, what other people is watching just to see how different I am from them. I call that my dark side. I want to see the most different person from in the world and what news they're watching, not because I want to read that news, because I want to know how far I'm my thinking from that person. Because today, and in every election, you see that. Uh, I think our perception is that people is similar to us than really is. So this is, will be one thing that, that I think should, should, should be done. The other thing is that, that we don't worry about the regulation part. And I understand that companies don't want to be regulated. Uh, I see that the insurance companies will, will fulfill that role. And then th that will become like health in the US, much more expensive. Because you will have to ensure the, the label data. You have to ensure um, what the programmers did. You have to ensure the model just in case uh, makes a mistake. Uh, and this will be a crazy world for us. Uh, and, and I think that's going to that because there are already, already companies insuring models. So this is like a, not, not something that will happen in the future. It's a, it's a current danger. Uh, and, and I'm worried about that because then software engineering will be a completely different world if we have insurance companies involved on that. Um, this is just to, to start to, to things. So I was actually thinking that healthcare would be one of the more promising areas because of the fact that it's already a uh, well-regulated area. So are you, Ricardo, are you saying that it, you actually think that it'll not be very promising because of no 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 maybe i was not clear so the, the promising thing is that health is much more expensive in the us because you have insurance companies involved and and if you involve insurance companies in, in software the, the developing software i imagine that any software that has ai will be more expensive in the future so so technology will be more expensive and also we haven't talked about the other problems that everything is more expensive then uh, rich people have more opportunities than poor people and, and we have basically we are we are increasing the technology gap between people, and that that with COVID has been very clear. I, 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 not not sure about the US, but I know about other countries. The people that don't have access to internet are much worse than the people that have access to internet. So the the the, the connectivity gap has increased everything, make make it even more fair, more unfair, and especially for women. For example, in Africa, uh, more women don't have internet than men. So, so this is also important there. So we are putting a one, one bias on top of the other, and this is a cascade of things that is getting worse because, for example, someone doesn't have internet or because that's, uh, someone doesn't have access to, to this, for example, to a smartphone, and we can keep uh, adding things. So then should we just ban it? No, no, I'm, I'm very positive about technology. I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I'm, uh, uh, they say that you have to be optimistic to be in Silicon Valley, and that's what I am. <laughs> so it's like a black hole. But but we need to be aware. We need to be conscious of how we use... Oh, by, by the way, I think maybe a, a great answer I heard uh, last year from Harari. We just have machine learning helping us dealing with all this. So we can have our, our own, he called it, armors of AI. And the only advantage that the, our armors of AI have against the big companies is that we have more data about ourselves. So, so this will be like an interesting thing. Like if someone will, will create me a, like a, something that will 
put me aware of things that I'm being biased or, or other people is biasing me, that would be great. I'll take the opposite stance. I, 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 I don't it. see any good in, in machine learning or AI. I'm I'm done with it. I'm I'm not interested. I mean, well, you know, like there's because right because I think the some of the conversation we're having, some of the conversation I'm seeing in the chat, right, is like, well, if we if we can learn how to responsibly use it, if we can learn how to responsibly care about how it affects people, but it's like there, are the because we live in a capitalist system, or at least you know most of us do, or if you live in you know North America, like it's. There is not an incentive for companies to care about those things, right? So you get back in 2009, right? Like Good Morning America broke that story about um, American Express, right? Like lowering people's credit card limits by profiling them and saying like, well, our other users who shopped at the same stores as you have a, a, a poor history of, of making payments. So we're going to lower your uh, credit limit in response. Like that's that has nothing to do with whether or not you are an ethical user of AI or if you understand how it works. That is that is someone dictating how that's going to be affecting your life in a very potentially serious way. You're like with like mortgages and uh, you know loans for like you know college or housing or automobiles. Like that's not something that individual responsibility is going to make any difference about. So may I, may I ask you a question, Alexander? So. So can we have like a AI strategies like in New Zealand where where economic growth is not the goal but it's a, a well well-being and we want more inclusion so can we have AI to to basically improve the world I I mean that sounds lovely um but I mean oh, I, I, I I don't I don't know how you would go about starting to do that right so I um like I mentioned before like I I use critical race theory as a framework in a lot of my work and and one of the more contentious tenets of critical race theory is interest convergence right and what interest convergence proposes is that it's not a more moral or ethical society that gains us uh, advancements in social justice and equity and, and, and human rights, it's only, that only happens when it's in the material interest of the majority, right? So if we look at this summer, you know, even with things like um, the resurgence of popularity and interest in Black Lives Matter, it is a critical mass of people. It's an economic interest that forces companies to, to suddenly make statements about racial equity. It's, it's not like that, that campaign existed for many years before it, it became in the economic interest of, of people to, to make that movement. So if you could find a way to align those interests, I think that would be great. But I, I don't think that that is where we're at right now. And we can't just rely on people like wanting to be better to make that happen. I, I think we're collapsing two things. I really do. Uh, AI is a nice buzz phrase. But all this is, all machine learning is, is essentially statistics at scale. Um, so it's not about the machine learning. It's not about the AI, it's about corporate behavior. And corporate behavior has always been of the same ilk as it is now. Yes, statistic, statistics at scale um, make certain things about corporate behavior more prescient. I get that. It also detects cancer earlier. Uh, I, 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 I don't oh, think the technology oh, is good. I, 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 I think the documentary makes that point, right? But then also what's pointed sure. out about that is then you're, you're lifting a lot of the the moral and ethical weight away from from the people who are making those decisions when you're using AI and ML so, in the way that we're using it right now. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I think this I think the solution is is the right the right sort of policy framework, the right sort of political discussions, the right sort of protesting like Black, Black Lives Matter and making it um, making it understood and then um, fighting the good fight so that we bring it under the people's control to the degree, to the degree that we can. I mean, I, I, think, I think the things that people have been saying both in the chat and here about the evils of AI are just the evils of capitalism or the evils of power disparity or the evils yeah. of inequity. Um, right. Let's fight those fights the way we've always fought them, says the old white man, I get it, but let's fight those fights the way we've always fought them um, and so that my daughter can grow up in an equitable world. Um, but I, I, I it just seems sad to me that we would be Luddites about a technology that uh, also saves lives. No, no, I, I, I agree with you, Craig, there, because, um, for example, the thing happened with the atomic bomb. You had the choice not to throw it, and, and sadly, the, uh, the country did it twice. 
but there's another very good uses of that same technology. And I believe that we can we can regulate to make that technology uh, use only for well-being. This is not, not true yet for many technologies, right? We still have a lot of uh, uh, arms of uh, mass destruction uh, available that sounds, they will not be good. No one is using them. But I would rather get rid of cars than AI, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah. I think they cause okay. far, far more evil in the world than yeah. AI. No, no, but for example, how much AI is being used today in military? In, in military? So I'm sure that three countries are using it, and I'm, I, I'm not aware of it. I prefer not to talk about it because I can't do anything about it. So I, I, I worked for the Navy for mm -hmm. a lot of years, and there's a lot of AI in the military, but not all of it, I, I, not all of it would you call bad. A lot oh, of it is oh, to, for sure. to... For sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, M many, many will be but like to, to uh, the other ways, to, to defend yourself, and that's good. No, just to make sure decisions are right. It oh. would, a, a lot of it's to make sure that decisions which have very dire consequences are more likely to be correct. Yeah, and th there's a very good example in the movie of this, when this uh, Russian person didn't uh, press the button to retaliate, and, and that was a software problem. That's uh, likely, I'm not sure how much was he aware of the software problem or the, because they don't say it in the movie, or was because of just being completely ethical and saying, I will not destroy the world. <clears throat> okay, so speaking of, of you know, inequities, I think now is the time to maybe turn to the, the chat and let them start asking some questions, give them some of the power. So, um, uh, okay, so, so let's see. Uh, what are we, what are our thoughts? Uh, saving lives through cancer research and building organs through synth uh, synthetic biology, but you can also design a contagious virus, another depiction of the duality. I'm wondering how we learn from AI and big tech to not make these consequences in health and science. Any thoughts on that? So I'll, I'll take that a little bit. Um, so I, I think one of the things that it's actually quite the opposite, we should learn from science and health and bring that into big tech. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the work I do is actually uh, talking about regulations and, and ethics in, in AI. And I think a lot of our problem is assuming that computer scientists know what we're doing. Um, there are a lot of fields that have been regulated before and have gone through this process. And I think science, uh, if you look at engineers, have a uh, do no harm clause that for professional engineers, as do doctors. And I think maybe we should look the other way personally and say, where, where are these fields where we've made sure that we're doing the right thing and maybe bring that into tech? That would be my response to that. Yeah, so an example from uh, from the the um, AI CS students that I was that I was um, running a, an ethics module for. Somebody brought up the good example of how uh, self driving cars they're not just allowed to just throw them on the street. Um, they have to pass through all these hurdles, and society seems to have a very good control over whether they're going to be allowed on the on the road or not. Um, but that's just not true with a lot of the other uh, algorithms that are just unleashed on the world. Um, and so if if somehow we can have uh, something more like driving regulations applied to some of these other algorithms. I don't see why they couldn't be reined in quite a bit. Yeah. Well, somebody's asking, should should software engineers be regulated like doctors if we're saying it's the programmer's responsibility? So not necessarily the resulting solution or software, but maybe it's the people. So I mean, that's the parallel that I, that's the parallel that I like the most is like examples of pharmaceuticals. So for example. If you have a particular drug that you say is going to cure cancer, you can't just, you know, start prescribing it for something else that it wasn't designed for. And I think that's one of the large problems with uh, with AI is just that uh, the tools are employed for other reasons that you would have never seen. Um, so I think having having similar kinds of regulations would be a good step. In the movie, in the movie, they they um, I, I don't remember the name of the author. I, I know her, but I, I, the name went away. But uh, she asked for FDA for algorithms. Um, so basically, we need to have an FDA for algorithms. And for example, uh, already uh, Helsinki and, and Amsterdam uh, have an office where you can basically register algorithms. And there are several um, recent uh, European AI strategies that the one that was just, uh, uh, and I, I belong to the committee that, that is doing this in Spain, they, they just released it today, the first version. They, they're asking for a government office to basically to register algorithms 
where people can later uh, uh, audit and say, okay, you said that you are going to do this, let me see if it's true or not. It's not like the FDA, but it's the first step to, for this. And I think this is a, at least the step we need to, to, be, to, uh, to, be, to do uh, if we want to enter in a, in a, like a real regulation. Okay, are there, are there any other questions that people well, have? One question I saw many times is, is who is accountable? I saw like <laughs> more people asking that question. So it's a hard question. Yeah, it's especially hard in, in corporate environments because the responsibility is kind of split. And corporate structures have, I think, a very good way of making sure that nobody is the one person making the decision. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's hard to say who exactly is the person that you hold to account when things go wrong, because you have a programmer doing one piece, a designer doing another piece, uh, you know, the various engineers doing other different kinds of pieces. Uh, it's, it's actually an extremely complicated problem. I don't have any answers to it. Well, but at, at the end, I think it should be accountable the, the company that sells the system, for example, if the system that is being sold or the, or the company that is using the system, if, if it's service. So I think legally, the owner, in some sense, should be accountable. But that's why I mentioned the insurance companies. Uh, at the end, maybe some insurance company will be accountable, and then the problem is solved, right? But we know we know it's not solved. <laughs> well, I know in Canada, there it looks like all of the AI regulations are going to go under privacy laws. So they're mm -hmm. expanding their privacy laws to incorporate automated decision making to to expand. So whoever is overseeing, you know. Um, privacy breaches. Um, that's how in Canada they're proposing. So they will, they will follow the European Union in this. Yeah, but does that, does that count? Does that cover things like um, um, we, uh, I think it was David Seidman who pointed this out. If, if, a, if an, an AI system systematically denied services to black people, that's not a privacy issue. That's just a uh, equal access issue, and that that's that's against the law. If the company, if if people did, in the company did that, and it should be against the law if an AI system did that, and the company should be equally held as responsible, as, held as responsible. Yeah, I th I think that's um, that's a really interesting point, right? So when when we're holding humans accountable, um, we have a, a certain process, and that's not done in every field, right? Um, we, we, there are some fields that you actually have to go out and say, okay, where is this, you know, is this human rights tribunal? Is it, how, how does this fit in? And then how do we, how do we appoint that blame when it's a machine? And I think the way that, um, the, the, the Canadian government is handling it is that you must have a human in the loop. And so, so then there's a, there is a human to blame, um, and it can't be fully automated. So. I think the problem is far more dispersed than any single office will be able to do it. I think that the office that's responsible for food and drug should be responsible for algorithms that make decisions about food and drug. The, the office that's responsible about fair employment pro practices should be responsible for algorithms that make decisions about fair employment, that impact fair employment practices and so on. H having a single, having a single um, policy group uh, who aren't going to understand all of the ins and outs of what's wrong in a particular field and how that algorithm could make that mistake is not going to do it. We have to permeate, since AI has permeated our society, we have to permeate the knowledge across, like I, I think from a liberation perspective, every kid from third grade on should learn everything about AI because that's going to be the life, that that's the world that they're going to live in. And every policymaker needs to understand it across the entire spectrum. Obviously, that's a, a ridiculous thing that we're not going to get to tomorrow. But I think we're not going to get to solutions until it just becomes that that the knowledge of AI and how AI works is as pervasive as AI itself. I, I completely agree with you, Craig, and, and that's why a patent office don't work. So. so we've solved capitalism, AI, and patents all in one group. That's excellent. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Um, does anybody, uh, so I'll, I'm going to go back to the chat and see if there are other questions that people are interested in, um, or if there's any topic that we, we haven't circled back on, um, from the panel. 
I, oh, sorry, I have one here. Um, where do you see us in 10 or 20 years if we continue to persist to allow biased AI in the way it is now? While we're waiting for another question. I'm really optimistic. I think we'll continue to have the kinds of summers we had this summer. People are gonna rise up against it. And I think it's gonna force um, corporate change. I hope, so. I hope to see. I hope to see more things like it's happening in New Zealand and other countries, where uh, where basically uh, heads of the state are taking different actions on on basically de decreasing inequality. Because at the end, there's nothing wrong with capitalism. The, the problem with capitalism is that there's no limit to it, and, and then people abuse of that. Uh, for example. Makes sense that that uh, all these statistics said that hundred people in the world have more wealth than half of the world. When I read these things, it's like, like we we cannot live in a, in a, in a so biased world. And because this is bias, this is like he is skewed bias, uh, and we need to solve this. And 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 I agree with Craig that at some point, like uh, like the Arab Spring and other things, people will complain. Chile last year. And basically, we want more. We want the same as other people have. <clears throat> but we are becoming very political now. It is not, not the eye. Alexander and Matt, I'm really shocked that you guys didn't rise up against my response saying that it's all going to be great and rosy in the future. Is that what you said? I did not read that that was what you said. <laughs> I said that we're that that the people are going to fight back. I, I heard I heard change. mass result of the revolt of the people, which I'm I'm excited about. That doesn't sound rosy, but it sounds great. Yeah, I just haven't seen the the willingness of people to stop enjoying the conveniences that they get from the products that are affecting them. So, like the cancel so Facebook right. movement had a bit of a had, made a little bit of a stock blip, but. People still use Facebook and it's spreading, it's sort of spreading everywhere. So the more people learn about the bad, um, the bad effects of these sort of corporate used AI systems, it doesn't seem to, yeah, it's just not making people uh, give up the conveniences, I think. Um, so I, that's, that makes me a bit skeptical. I don't think people will rise up because they haven't already when they found out about the negatives. I took it as an ironic comment, Craig. So I'm not, I was not sure if you really meant that. Or not. No, I actually do. I think that, uh, but 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 I don't mean it that things the world's going to be rosy. Um, but okay. um, and I've and I've purposely avoided the question of whether <clears throat> people's choosing convenience is necessarily a bad thing, because I don't have a strong opinion on it. So I'm gonna, I, I think one thing that um, I'd like to do to wrap up here, because we still have um, over 50 people here engaged and it's been a fantastic conversation, but I, I think since it, it seems a lot about personal responsibility at this point. So, so given that we have students, we have people in industry, we have uh, ethicists, we have computer scientists. Um, if, I'd like to go around again alphabetically um, and just see what do you think our, our attendees and we can ask of each other to go and do to um, see to, to make this a better place in, in 10 years and, and not necessarily the, the bad place that this could end up. Uh, I'll, I'll take a very academic stance on that, um, which is that I think that there's a lot of power in doing multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary work. Um, so, you know, as I said, right, I am a computer scientist, uh, but I'm a computer scientist that speaks to people in the digital humanities and communications and uh, ethnic studies, right? And I think that there's a lot of, a lot of that great critical work about these systems that we're talking about those conversations are many years old in these other fields that have been watching what we're doing in computing and saying, hey, uh, that's really not okay, we need to talk about this. So I think forming those kinds of cross-disciplinary coalitions, I just wanna remind everyone out there who, who feels overwhelmed by these issues, you do not have to start from scratch, right? You, if you are able to partner with people 
um, you can do, you can get a lot further and, and do a lot of really great work and you don't have to feel like you have to invent the future all on your own. Bethany, I skipped you last time. I didn't know whether you're part of the alphabet in here. I'll, I'll wrap up at the end. You can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, um, it, it's very personal for me. I, it's very avocational for me. I don't think I'm going to have an impact at a policy level. I don't think I'm going to have an impact at a capitalism level. Um, I, I, I don't think I'll have uh, uh, sort of a, like, like inventing the system that comes next. Um, that's for the youth. And I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I think that the thing you can do is educate yourself. The reason I teach at Northeastern is exactly for this reason. I think the more people know about the technology, the more they can make informed decisions about how this technology impacts their lives. Um, and I think that both externally through my advocational efforts at, at places like Northeastern, but also I think about it internally in the corporation. Like um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us who work in this field to not let a opportunity to educate someone slip by, to not let an opportunity to complain about bias slip by. I sent three emails today that said things like, how did you sample this? Did you make sure you covered all skin colors? Did you make sure that you um, that this does, isn't going to have an inordinate impact on someone's ability to uh, ability to make money or access to resources? And I think I think this is incumbent upon all of us to educate ourselves and ask the right questions. Which sounds kind of pie in the sky, but I think it's what I can do. So just to build off that, I think um, there were a lot of good comments uh, after the the one inflammatory thing that I said about people being programmers being responsible. <laughs> so, um, but a lot, a lot of people a lot of people mentioned a very good point, which is that speaking up and educating people is has different risks for different people, um, and I totally agree with that. So, um, what what I was what I was trying to say originally. So this is just just to have a, a philosophical uh, diversion. So. Um, just saying that you have a moral obligation not to do something, I don't think that means that you, you shouldn't do it, all things considered. It just means that it's pushing you in that direction. I think that a lot of the, a lot of the students that are on this thread will have a lot of choices um, about where they end up being employed. And I think uh, finding out about the, the corporation that, or the corporation or company or wherever they're being employed, maybe it might be an NGO or something, finding out about uh, a little bit more about what they do and what they've been implicated in, I think is, is something that is worth doing and then making the choice that's right for them uh, given their circumstances. Um, so I, I think that's the, that's the first step is making sure that you're sort of working for things that are pushing in the right direction. Uh, and then the other thing I'll say is I think it's, it's everybody has an obligation to themselves to get off social media. Um, the research is just piling up. It just seems to be bad for everybody. Um, so that, but that's just a personal obligation to yourself, I think, not necessarily to the world. So uh, all social media, Matt, even Twitter is bad. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what that's what seems to be the that seems to be what what research is finding. It's just it's generally bad for you. No, no, I, I do research on that. That's why I, I understand yeah. that even for me, it's hard to, to leave yeah. uh, a world that I, I have uh, helped to construct, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's like leaving your, your, partly your baby behind. I would say that, that my, my would be a very pragmatic method. I think uh, all these problems just start by, by understanding your own biases. So you need to, to do like a, a little bit of a, conscious thinking saying, uh, I want to be aware of my limitations. And, and many people don't know them until they're aware of, of some bias. So for example, even if it's encoded in language, so, so some people don't even notice when they're saying racist, racist things or sexist things because they're encoded in language until someone points that out and, they're, and, 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 and becomes uh, known. Remember, things are not obvious until they're known. There's a book, a former colleague of mine on that. So things are not obvious until you know them. Um, so this will be the first step. And then I agree with you. And if you can work in a, in a company or NGO that is uh, trying to uh, improve the world, I think that's uh, what many people, more people should do. But not always you have alternatives. That's, a, that's a, an issue. So for, um, for example, I think it was um, David that said, what happens is the only job you can, the only job you can get is in, is in, in a company that's not ethical. What do you do? 
it's a, it's a tough question. It's a very personal question. I, I would not say what should be the right answer. So, so what I'd say is um, exactly what people did here, which is listen and, and like Alexander said, get a group of people together that are different and have different points. Um, because I think that's one thing that's really lacking. And it is one of the downsides of social media that we've heard about is that you're not exposed to different people. You're not exposed to different viewpoints. You're actually gone down a rabbit hole. And so um, I really appreciate that people from all different areas and, and research disciplines uh, were able to come together and, and disagree and agree on, on this topic. And I really appreciate that. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. What I would ask the, the attendees uh, to do is if you look on the other side, for me, it's this side, I don't know which side it is. There's a networking component. Um, and so the reason why we chose Hopin, which is not a technology many of you have used before, I don't think, um, it actually has a networking component. So you can get to know uh, and meet the people that are here and we can do some chatting and actually have some of this discussion. Uh, there's been a fantastic chat in the, in, the, in the actual stage chat, but if you go to networking, you can actually uh, go through and it will introduce you as if you're walking down the halls and introducing yourself. I actually like it better because it's less awkward to be like, to actually go up to somebody and start a conversation because it actually says, I'm looking to meet somebody um, and it will introduce you and, and pair you up just to introduce yourself, say who you are um, and maybe some comments. Uh, and it's limited. So if you don't like the person, it also will, will <laughs> stop the conversation after two minutes. You can continue it if you want, but you're only stuck for, for a maximum of two minutes. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a great tool. Um, so thank you all for, for coming. And um, uh, please uh, enjoy the networking part of the, of the session. Thank you. thank you, Bethany, for moderating. Great. Yeah, thanks, Bethany. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.